So, uh, welcome to everybody, and welcome uh, John Nash and Louis Narenberg. What a wonderful ceremony, and congratulations again uh, to you both. So, now is the moment when we have an opportunity, not only for these good people here, but to the many people who can't come to the ceremony, but uh, who will watch this on the internet later, to talk a little bit not so much about your math, but your life and your life in math. So we had a little bit at the bi uh, during the ceremony about uh, what uh, drew you into math. Uh, let's start uh, with you, John. What was it that first made you think about an interest in math? Because you didn't, to be fair, shine at maths at school particularly, but yet somehow something sparked your interest? No, well, that's, that's correct that I didn't shine in math. It's sort of like saying that Einstein didn't shine in school in <laughs> Ulm, Germany. <laughs> well, you can, you can look at records there and you, you find their average grades, but so I, I had my grades were all right <laughs> in Bluefield, West Virginia. It wasn't these assigned works that this was most challenging. <laughs> I I let myself be challenged by doing arithmetic on numbers with more digits or more digits, but adding and subtracting that sort of thing. So it was the challenging stuff that made you really interested in maths. It was challenging yourself that made you interested. Well, I don't know. Mathematics is a natural enough interest. There are many others. And Louis, how about you? Because your father was a, a teacher of Hebrew. There wasn't any maths in the family. What sparked your interest? I think it began when he tried to teach me Hebrew and I foolishly resisted and never learned, to my shame, never learned Hebrew. But he hired a friend to teach me, give me lessons in Hebrew, and that friend liked mathematical puzzles. And so he, every, at every lesson he brought mathematical puzzles. And somehow that began my interest in mathematics. And then uh, I went to a very good high school during Depression and uh, the teachers were excellent, and in particular, the, the mathematics and physics teachers were extremely good, and I decided I would like to be a physicist. And then late, I studied mathematics and physics in, in college at McGill University, and uh, then by, by chance, lucky chance, I told the story at, at the uh, ceremony, by lucky chance, I got a, an assistantship in mathematics at New York University, and have been there ever since. I just never left. So it was lucky chance uh, for you. Yeah. And uh, uh, John, you actually went to university first of all to do chemical engineering. That's where at Carnegie. And yeah. what was it that again switched you? Was it you had a mentor? Was it John Singe who persuaded you to go into math? There was there was a professor there who was very stimulating, and there were two other professors that were connected with the department of administration. And, um, well, I guess there were some influential figures. figures. When John Lighton Singh, he probably knows of John Lighton Singh, the, the father of Kathleen C. Marowitz. <laughs> He was a teacher there for a certain period of time. He, he'd come in from Canada. He was originally British. Uh, I said Irish, British, Irish. Oh, oh. Well, when he was born, there was, uh, there was not a separate Ireland. So thinking about that, thinking about your early days, thinking about your careers now, we have a lot of young people here in the audience today. What would you do to make children more interested in math? Well, I, I 
left out of one thing. The math, American Mathematical Society has had, for, it's been associated for some time for uh, a concept of the epsilons. And this was favored by a, a, a famous traveling mathematics person named, named Paul Erdős. And now, well, I, in the end, I decided to make a small contribution for pres, professional advancement through the Epsilon Fund, which represents these interests in it's like a, 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 a UNESCO for, for young mathematicians. And Louis, would you agree with that? And is there anything that you, we can do to stimulate the interest of women in maths? I mean, we haven't got a female Arbol Prize winner yet. Not yet, but I'm sure it will, it will come. There are some wonderful women in mathematics. I hope there will be more. I think part of it is the culture that, we, that girls are not encouraged somehow to go into science when they're young. I think that's part of the atmosphere, part of the culture, and I hope that will change. Also, many teachers of mathematics in the United States don't seem to know much mathematics. And so they often, many students find the subject boring. It isn't boring, it's a wonderful subject. It's really a joy, it's an absolute joy just to do research in mathematics. Once you're hooked, you're hooked, it's, it's incredible. And of course you have to be curious and I would like to recommend a book which, about a person who was incredibly curious, that was the physicist Richard Feynman. He wrote an autobiography, and the f I recommend the first volume, which is called, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. That's the name of the book. And it's a wonderful book. I encourage you all to read it and to meet a fantastic, a person with fantastic curiosity. Not just about physics, just about life in general. And it gives you joy, clearly, to do math. And how about you, John? Do you... F do you find yourself in a state of joy when you're doing your math? At times, but uh, it may be at times not. Uh, these uh, times vary. <laughs> there certainly have been times. And, uh, yes, and even unemployed, I, s I would spend a lot of time doing mathematics, really doing mathematical research, and that relates to what I will talk about in, in terms of my, my topic it comes up tomorrow, I think. Because the president of the Norwegian Academy, uh, Kirsty Strombull today, talked about maths being timeless and universal. universal. For, for, for me, maths is the science that is closest to art. It's straddles the two. It's, you have to be highly creative to do very well in maths. And I wondered whether you thought that actually maths was an art, a bit like poetry sometimes. That has been, a, 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 I have something to say about that by coincidence. Because I went to Princeton at a, at a certain time and there were certain professors there the Professor Salomon Lefschitz, Professor Emil Artin, and others. And Artin, he 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 come from Germany, and, but he somehow got into a position. I don't know how it was psychologically, but he got a very doctrinaire about math. Mathematics is an art, and to the extent that it is saying it's an art, rather than being a science, because uh, um, more typically it's artistic and scientifically very significant. But he, he liked to say it is an art, but maybe it's because his name was Artin. <laughs> <laughs> And how about you, Louis? Do you find math to be an art? Uh, I think it is an, an art. Uh, it's, you need a lot of intuition to do it. 
you need a lot of stubbornness to do it, which may be an art. Maybe poets don't have stubbornness, I don't know, but in, in mathematics, you need to be, have, be very stubborn, you need to be very perseverant, and as, as John was implying, you don't have joy all the time. In fact, you're stuck most of the time when you're doing mathematics, but you don't give up. And it's still a pleasure to try, even if you're stuck, it, you keep trying and trying and trying. But connection with poetry, I'm not so sure about that. I would think of it more connected with art and with music rather than with poetry. Because you are both very interested in music, you particularly, Louis. Yeah, I love music, and uh, yeah, it's a great joy. I'm sorry I never learned to play an instrument, though my parents offered it. There again, I made a foolish decision. <laughs> and I hear that you were once a fine whistler of Bach, and you enjoy music too. Yes, I did like to Bach music for whistling. I used to be able to whistle well. I, I can't do it now. There's some way of getting that vibration activated from the current of air. <laughs> and it's the funny that you is not quite right. That both of you are attracted to music that's actually very complex in its uh, patterns, and I wonder if that's something to do that with your both the math skills and the music both coming together. Well, I, I've read that uh, people who examine the brain observe that the same part of the brain lights up when you're active in music and active in mathematics which I find remarkable. There you are. How, I was wondering how you both went about choosing the problems that you worked on. John, how about you? How did you, did the problems suggest themselves or did you go out and find the problems? Well, I, I don't know that I can say a, a general pattern, but I, probably there are patterns that, that I could look at. I did this rather than that. I, what I didn't do is to become a graduate student studying under a professor who would then assign me a special case in an area of research where he's studying. And, that's sometimes very difficult for graduate students, isn't it? Because they, a, a, they get a piece of work that's really difficult and they never shine. Uh, and well, to choose your own, though, is a very dangerous road for some. But you succeeded triumphantly with your thesis at, uh, at, at, uh, uh, when you did a, the, that led to game theory and, of course, to the Nobel but Prize. I <coughs> but I didn't have that experience of falling under the influence of someone who assigned me something. Mm -hmm. Professor Arton at Princeton might have been I, I don't I can't say he wasn't wasn't he had he had very good students like uh, by the way uh, uh, John Tate who is one of the uh, one of the uh, I'll know. I'll know. The, uh, the Abel Harris, right. he's a student of Arden. No. He's a very prime student at the time, I guess. And John, how do you know, when you're in the midst of a problem that no one else has ever tackled before, how do you know whether you're going up the wrong road? How do you know that what you're doing is on the right track? Well, you don't know. <laughs> it's like someone you think you can build a Panama Canal or a Nicaragua Canal, but you don't know until you, you get it done. And, Louis, how did you choose your problems and how do you know when you're on well, the right track? My thesis problem I didn't choose. In fact, when I was a graduate student, I was concerned that I would have trouble finding a problem on, on my own. And that problem was suggested to me. 
and then in the process of working on it, I then learned something about the field of partial differential equations. It was a problem in geometry, but it involved solving partial nonlinear partial differential equations. So I, I came into that subject, and I've remained in that subject all the time. All my work is connected with partial differential equations. Now, I asked you before whether your partial differential equations, what you were proudest of in terms of their practical impact. And you said to me that you didn't think that they had had much practical uh, impact. Well, I, I know people use some of the uh, estimates that we developed, but when you say practical, I mean, it's not that they use them in everyday life. And I think I told you yesterday, I would be delighted if something that I could, if I could do something that actually had some practical application. It would give me enormous pleasure. Well, I'm going to start a Twitter campaign, ladies and gentlemen, the practical applications of, from Louis Narenberg's work. And I started that already, and already people are coming in saying, yes, <laughs> there are thousands. <laughs> <laughs> Now, uh, John, I wanted to turn to you. Now, it said that your work on partial differential equations uh, impacts even more strongly on real-world problems, uh, you know, modeling uh, uh, complexities, how societies evolve and uh, change, and that actually the practical impact of your partial differential equations may be even greater than the impact of your work on game theory. But I don't see this example you talking about evolving of houses or what, what, what is the... Evolving of societies and uh, in, in biological terms and mathematical modeling. It sounds modeling. a little like game theory and economics. It sounds like you're mixing in some of the game theory and economics ideas and describing it as partial differential equations. So your work, though, the, is it, are you, when you see things like the auction of, um, of, of air, air wave widths and all those sorts of things, are you proud that it's your game theory that has set that up? Well, it's game theory, and it's the type of game theory that I introduced. And I'm very sure I didn't do too many specific cases before I was doing other things. And uh, they, people have a way of choosing how they talk about things. You, you see something, so and so, and you see it as game theory. Someone else sees something else and doesn't see it as game theory, doesn't talk about it. But you saved but the American taxpayer a lot of money. Well, <laughs> it'd be good if it could save some money in Iraq or the ISIS is, is operating. <laughs> sort of going on the treasury pretty heavily in our problem. John, you lost many years of your working life uh, to ill health. And I wonder, looking back on your life and seeing the many mathematical problems that are, that are out there, what would you have done if you had not had those years taken away from you? What problems would you like to have attacked? <coughs> Well, mental health has, has its subtleties because in, in many cases it has a voluntary element. So I spoke once to a group of psychiatrists, more or less in later times, and I, I had a topic, at Minds on Strike. And I said, well, the people housed in your institutions can be considered as minds on strike. They produce an economic drain uh, because, of course, they supply opportunities for labor by allowing maybe other people to do the jobs that they might have been doing if they were working. But there is this phenomenon. When I, when I was mentally disturbed, I did go on strike. In effect, I was I wasn't available to do my regular work. Like at MIT, I was supposed to have functions of various levels. You know, I wasn't the administrator. I wasn't purely research. I 
a teaching and so on. But when I, if I can begin to disturb this is the original time of disturbance in 1959, I, I just didn't want to continue all the work that I was doing. What would you have liked to have done had you been well? What would you What would you have liked to have tackled had you been well? Well, you look at well now. These things, there are <coughs> sort of Polynesian paradises when there isn't where there isn't so much to work to do, sort of like a Garden of Eden or Adams and Eves. In a place like that, it doesn't quite seem to say that that everyone who is well is busily working because the, the, the place itself might not call for much work unless it still gets maybe overcrowded and they can't just live on the tree of life. So, uh, the well is, is when people that are under the, Mental, administ mental health administration or observation. When they're well, it's when they're behaving as we desire, as we prefer. When they're unwell, it's when they're taking it off, taking, and not, not doing their work, or any, maybe any work. So, there's some subtleties about mental health Insanity and insanity, I think. How you look at it can, can be philosophically modified. And since you've recovered, you have been working in cosmology. That was a field that... Uh, why w did that field particularly attract you? Well, I had an interest in cosmology. Why is it attractive? Well, it, it is attractive, like, if you uh, uh, ask about the universe, is it infinite or finite? You can say one thing or another, prefer. But it's also the question of it, it is spatially infinite or finite, if you concern only with a sort of spatial cross-section section of it. It might be like a cone that is infinite, but it's, it's, it's fi always finite on a spatial level. It's an expanding finite, finite sphere. Fascinating area to work in. And uh, Louis, you've continued working, and you still do math. Well, I try. I'm not very successful, but I, I'm still tr I still try. It's still I suspect you're rather more successful than the rest yeah. of us. <laughs> no, no, right now I'm not successful at all. But it's still a pleasure to try. I just, I can't resist trying. I still try. Yeah. And I make many mistakes these days, unfortunately. Loads of mistakes. But, okay. So I think it, it's allowed. It's allowed, yes. <laughs> Gentlemen, we've had a fascinating discussion uh, with you. It's such a pleasure to be with two people who have done so much uh, for mathematics and indeed uh, for the world, no matter what you claim, Louis Narenberg. <laughs> so uh, to both of you, uh, congratulations again and thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you.